Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm Ryan Hill. Before we get started, just a reminder that we're still producing every episode remotely. We try to make it sound like we're all in the same room, but we actually record everyone separately on opposite coast for this episode. Audio glitches can and do happen, so we hope you'll be understanding of any less than perfect sound in this and future episodes. This week, Zach and Roger are talking with Mark Weir, Senior Technology Manager at Sony USA. You'll hear details about the design and tech behind the new A7S III, which I'm sure is a camera a lot of our listeners are looking forward to. Even more interestingly, though, you'll hear about the broader approach Sony takes to product design. A company as large as Sony has to design products for so many different people, amateur photographers, professional photographers, vloggers, cinematographers, and every one of those markets has different needs. The challenge is to figure out who needs which features in which product, and the decisions that go into meeting that challenge can show us where the industry might be heading in the future. Here are Roger and Zach. Good afternoon. I'm Roger Sakala. I'm here with Zach Sutton, and our guest today is an old friend, Mark Weir. Uh, Mark and I have gone back a decade talking about various things and basically having a good time in the imaging business, so I'm excited to get to talk with him for a while today. Yeah, thanks for joining us today, Mark. Excited to be here with you guys. So for those who are unfamiliar with Mark, Mark works with Sony uh electronics you are the senior manager in technology and marketing for them and you've worked for sony for over 30 years correct yeah it'll be 35 years in just a couple of months wow that's incredible so i i mean i'm sure you've seen everything you know obviously sony creates all sorts of different products when did you get you know i know you best this sort of being being the guy behind uh, a lot of Sony imaging and Sony's, you know, transition into the camera world in recent years. When did you start working further into the the camera camera creation and, and marketing and technology for that? Well, actually, I was a sort of a working semi pro photographer throughout high school and college, and then I transitioned over into the audio business. And I was hired into Sony at the very beginning of 1986 in the audio business, and didn't move over to imaging until the beginning of 1999. And at the time, Sony had been transitioning from making video products, camcorders, into the world of still imaging. Uh, We had launched Mavica in 1997, and we launched Cybershot in 1998 and 1999. So I joined imaging at the beginning of 1999. The Mavica, was that the camera that wrote to uh, a disc? Yeah, it was um, floppy disk Mavica. We actually introduced Mavica, uh, video high band Mavica in 1981 and uh, in a consumer version of it in 1987. But those were analog uh, cameras. That's what I remembered. That's awesome. So we've we've come certainly a, a long way. Uh, and, and Sony just recently announced three new cameras that we want to talk about. Uh, the first one that we want to talk about is um, the continuation to the A7S line, and that is with the Sony A7S Mark III. Uh, it was I saw rumors starting for this camera, like legitimate rumors starting for this camera back in February, uh, but then it wasn't announced until this summer, and it's just now starting to roll off the shelves, right? Yeah, we started, uh, first customer shipment was uh, on September 24th. So from September 24th to now is when, uh, you know, initial pre-orders were filled and the camera's getting into people's hands, yes. And for those that are unaware of the uh, A7S III, it is a 12.1 megapixel full-frame sensor, an ISO range of expanded 40 to 409,000. It shoots 4K at 422 10-bit internal at 120 frames per second. It has the whole in-body image stabilization 5-axis. And it has a list price of about 3500 Now, the A7S, you know, from, from my experience at least, has been very much your guys' push into the, the professional and semi-professional video world in your mirrorless platform, right? Yeah, it has been received that way. But the irony with A7S has always been that the S stands for sensitivity. And the purpose of, or the the role of A7S was to realize extraordinarily high 
sensitivity and low noise and wide dynamic range, not only for still capture, but also for video capture. But because that's such an advantage in video capture, it rapidly became known as the go-to super compact size camera that could be used anywhere from documentary filmmaking all the way up to studio produced major motion picture production. So it rapidly became known as a go-to camera for video, especially due to its incredibly small size and very large image sensor and very high sensitivity. And 7S III becomes just the latest version of it. Yeah. So I, I'm sure Roger can speak more on this too. But one thing that I do want to talk about, uh, you know, you guys, especially with the, you know, the A7R line, um, and, and I'm just now realizing S is for sensitivity, R is probably for resolution. Uh, you guys have always had pretty high resolution cameras come out of the R line. And this A7S III is a 12.1 megapixel sensor, which is designed, like you said, probably more predominantly for video use. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I know that there's always conversations about, you know, does does resolution matter? And there was, you know, the megapixel war a few years ago where every camera was just trying to step it up. For me personally, 12 megapixels seems very usable, but I'm sure that that number probably scares a few people uh, looking to you know, buy their next camera. Yeah, and the resolution that's in the S series is unintentional. It's purpose-built, and it reflects one of the great advantages that we have in camera design in that we are also a primary, if not the primary, manufacturer of image sensors used in cameras. And that gives us the flexibility to leverage our sensor technology to realize cameras that perhaps others would not. What 12 megapixels allows us to do in S series is maximize the pixel well size for dynamic range and high sensitivity. And it also allows us to do something that is very rare in video capture, particularly in large sensor cameras, and that is uh, have dot by dot readout without the need for pixel binning or line skipping or even oversampling, for instance. We can get native 4K resolution or near native 4K resolution because with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, the 12 megapixel sensor is about 4.2K. So we have almost exactly the right number of pixels to create 4K with this sensor. But there's another factor as well, and that is sensor read speed. And although oversampling is used in numerous cameras for improvements in image quality, uh, it does take processor overhead and it does take time. And one of the great advantages of having just the right number of pixels is you can get the data off the sensor very rapidly. And that is a huge benefit not only for rolling shutter reduction, but also it's a huge benefit for autofocus performance. Mark, does the, the ability of the, the high read speed have much to do with the ability to shoot 120 frames per second, or is that a different thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that as well. If you can't get the data off the sensor rapidly enough, you can't achieve the higher and higher frame rates. Or if you are going to achieve the higher frame rates, you're going to do it with uh, a significant crop. So what a number of manufacturers have done, uh, and Sony has done it from time to time as well, it's not unique to, uh, to any one manufacturer, to realize higher and higher frame rates to scan a smaller and smaller area of the sensor. But you get in the entire image at 120 frames on this, right? Yeah, full width at 120 frames per second, and not just at 120 frames per second with 42210-bit, but also 16-bit raw across the full width of the sensor. So the sensor pixel count touches so many different aspects of the performance of the camera. And again, it's a luxury that we have at Sony that we can you know, grab a purpose-built sensor and realize a camera that's not like any other simply by virtue of the nature of the devices that are in it. Wow, that's impressive. Well, I know myself and plenty of the video staff at Lens Rentals is really, really excited to get their hands on this camera. And uh, we're hoping to have some here in stock soon. Uh, another camera that I wanted to talk about is the new one that you guys have put out called the Sony A7C. 
And I assume that the C for that one stands for compact, correct? Yes, it does. Okay, so the, the A7C is a 24 megapixel full frame sensor, has an ISO range of 50 to 204,000, it shoots 4K 420 8-bit, uh, has the in-body stabilization, and it has a $1,800 price point. Uh, this is a quite a bit smaller, and, and certainly the Alpha Series line for from you guys has already been an incredibly small camera in comparison to a lot of the competition, but this one's been stripped down even further could you tell us a little bit about the A7C? Sure. Uh, well, again, we try not to think of it as stripped down, but rather miniaturized, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But 7C is a camera that reflects some of the customer research that we have done. And one of the things that our research has shown that there are a number of camera purchase intenders or even camera owners who recognize the value that full-frame cameras are providing in terms of performance, but are not fully on board, shall we say, due to the perception of size and weight and cost. So our intention with 7C was to create the smallest full-frame camera available with certain conditions. Uh, those conditions are that it be an interchangeable lens camera, and those conditions also include that it have you know, a mechanical shutter and uh, in-camera image stabilization, which we would expect most end users would expect when considering a full-frame camera. We also want to appeal to an end-user segment that the whole industry is um, appealing to or working to appeal to, and that is the rapidly growing customer base of content creators. And if we could provide a full-frame camera in a compact size, which is very important if you're on a gimbal or if you're self-shooting, and we can include those features which are very important, like a forward-facing screen, an excellent audio capability, an excellent stabilization capability, and affordable price, we figure that that would be very appealing to that user base as well. But our intention is to create a combination of benefits that appeals to new and emerging user segments in a way in which other cameras do not. But that's the plan behind uh, 7C. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be a really great, great option. Uh, and then finally, your your third kind of announcement in the last couple months is the Sony ZV-1 camera system. Uh, and this this camera is designed, at least from my understanding, for kind of vloggers and influencers and people that are in the YouTube space that are looking for a really, really great video camera that's both affordable and, and you know, has great image quality. And this, this system is a 20 megapixel, one inch sensor, ISO range from 64 to 25,000, uh, 4K up to 30 frames per second, and has a list price of about $800. Tell us a little bit about the, the ZV-1. The ZV-1 story is somewhat like A7C here, Rather than using a full-frame platform, we're using the platform of our one-inch sensor cameras, which are our RX100 cameras. That type of camera, the, the whole class of camera that exists in the industry that uses a one-inch sensor is very popular, particularly if you consider the strength of the fixed-lens camera business. And our intention with ZV-1 is to borrow a lot of the devices and the technology found in RX100, in this case, RX100 Mark 5A, and then add to it the advantages that content creators expect in a camera for this purpose to realize a unique solution for them as well. Uh, in this camera, we, uh, again, it's a significantly smaller sensor. It's a fixed lens as opposed to an interchangeable lens. But we also managed to, within the approximately the same body size, to realize a forward-facing screen, a unique three-capsule microphone system for very directional pickup. The uh, image stabilization system in the camera can record metadata that can be used to stabilize the image in post, as well as having uh, lens shift image stabilization. We also addressed different 
requirements that we learned from bloggers and content creators about how the focusing system should work and how it should be able to be configured to track objects and faces at different rates of speed because many times bloggers are needless to say they are in uh, the video that they're capturing and sometimes they're trying to explain a product or an object uh, and they want to hold it up to the camera and they would want the camera to quickly recognize the focusing system of the camera to quickly recognize that it should be focusing on that object instead of the face so we put in a, a feature specifically that allows you to configure the tracking sensitivity to yield the result that the end user is looking for and that's again the idea is to take our technology and adapt it to meet the requirements of different use cases that are now emerging and to provide compelling solutions for those end users you know i, I understand the products a lot better after hearing you talk about them mark that makes perfect sense well thanks roger well, you know, of course, cameras aren't my thing, but lenses are. <laughs> and given that, <laughs> I think at this point we'll take a short break, uh, come back in a few minutes, and we're going to talk some technical stuff with uh, the man known throughout Sony as the professor. <laughs> See you in just a second. If you only know lens rentals from our yelling about cameras on the internet, there's more to the story. We're actually the largest online videography and photography equipment rental house in the entire world. Cameras, lenses, lights, audio, drones, just about anything. Here's how it works. Just go to lensrentals.com and tell us what you need and when you need it. We ship it straight to you in protective cases. You use it for whatever your heart desires, then ship it back to us with the included return label. Next time you need equipment for a shoot, head to lensrentals.com slash podcast for a discount on your order. That's lensrentals.com slash podcast. Mark, I've got a question since we've been talking about these cameras because I see the the different parts of Sony's lineup, and this is going to be two parts, so I'll give you the first part first. It seems nowadays I'm starting to see kind of a, a set of groups of cameras going in certain directions. You've got really a dedicated performance sport uh, action still camera. You've got uh, several mostly video lineup cameras or video-centric cameras, and then the, the base photo cameras that can also do a little bit of everything. Is that three-pronged lineup? Does that is that kind of where Sony's going ahead in the future, or do you know yet? Well, if you look at the 7 and the 9 series, that's a pretty good description because the 7 series without a letter in, a, in the title um, is, is sort of the all-around camera, and describing it as the all-around camera has always been a bit of a challenge to us. Then the 7S is for sensitivity. The 7R is for resolution. And A9 is really for speed. And, uh, and and you could say sports, but really what it's about is it's, it's about responsiveness and speed. And it's also not just speed, it's also uh, connectivity that uh, sports photographers require. But a lot of what the camera becomes or our ability to make the camera what it needs to be is not really so much by design as it is by device. And if you look at the different cameras, they are what they are because of the devices that are in them. The 7 Series without a letter is, you know, some would consider it to be a mundane 24 megapixel sensor, but a lot of it is that's, you know, of the 24 megapixel sensors that are out there, it's, it, even though it's three years old, it's a pretty good one. And a lot of cameras in the industry other than ours are using that sensor. If we need resolution, we have you know, the full force of what Sony's done in high megapixel count sensors. If we want sensitivity, we have the opposite. We have the full weight and source uh, and force of a, a low pixel count sensor that other manufacturers wouldn't dare make, but we make and uh, manage to use it to great effect. Uh, and then in the A9, we have something that's unique that doesn't exist anywhere else in the industry, and that's a stacked CMOS full frame image sensor. So it, it's really... It's a combination of how we can perceive what the end user needs and how we can bend or leverage the device technology that is available to realize the requirements that they have. 
the second part of what I wanted to talk about, and this is <laughs> this is my entertainment. I, I'm famous as being the not the first generation guy, and and back in 2010 and 11, when the first generations were coming out, I was like, well, it'll take years, and then you know we'll see this technology change, and it's going to take years to make a lens lineup, and then Sony just made a fool out of me, introducing cameras right and left and lenses faster than really I think anybody ever has. I think for several years you were making more new lenses every year than any company. Can you keep that breakneck pace up forever? Well, it's an interesting question, and I don't know that I'm qualified to comment on what Sony is and is not capable of, but I would say that one factor in development is a company's capability of planning and developing and designing and manufacturing a new model. But another factor that is also important to consider is the device technology. Uh, There are plenty of models that have been introduced that utilize the same technology that accomplish iterative changes, incremental changes in performance and capability. And then there are products that incorporate all new technologies or all new devices that take a major step. And I would say that Realizing those game-changing products, as they're often called, reflects a company's capability at planning and designing and developing and manufacturing, but it also reflects a company's ability to have the key devices that make all of that possible. And vertically integrated companies that have the, the, the pleasure, the benefit of having all in-house development and device to end product flexibility enjoy the opportunity to make more significant products, shall we say, than those that do not. And I think that that's one of the great advantages that we have in that we're creating the devices themselves as well as, well as the finished product. It gives us a lot more flexibility. I'm going to add in here that it's nice to know that when a new letter or number comes out, there's something new in the camera. We've all seen basically the version two that has new paint uh, and things like that. You guys tend to go, I look forward from my point of view, but opening it up, see, what did you do this time? Me too. Me too. And it's interesting because it isn't just cameras. We always think about that in terms of, is it just the camera? It also applies to lenses as well. Uh, and, and the changes that we've seen in the lens industry, not just Sony, but the lens industry, I think is we've seen greater changes in the lens industry in the last uh, two, three years than we've seen in uh, probably the last 10 or 15. Oh, absolutely. Now, I may be wrong. You, 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 you know better than I, but back in the day, you guys were either the first or very much among the first to come out with uh, linear focusing, electromagnetic focusing motors. You had the technology, but also the willingness to give it a try, which I think some people may have sat on. Yeah, a lot of that happened pretty much around 2010. And uh, mm-hmm. I, remember, I remember those days well when uh, the <laughs> industry had just started. I, I mean, realistically, it started at the end of 2008. But the industry had just begun to realize that the shift from the uh, optical mechanical camera to the, what many have called the solid state camera or the camera that relied less and less on mechanisms and moving parts uh, was, was going to happen. I think most recognize that that's where camera development will continue uh, with mirrorless. And for us, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it, it, it was a, uh, it was a challenge because we had, we had already started with uh, feet, planted firmly in the mechanical SLR business and recognizing the extent of the change that would be required, not only on the camera side, but on the lens side was, uh, you know, it's, it was, it was a challenge. And, but I, I think we've done very well because we had the advantage of recognizing it early on. And as a result, we've been able to do that, which really is necessary to support a fully realized mirrorless system, which is not only to develop the cameras, but also the lenses. We now have 58 
from the ground up mirrorless lenses. And uh, I think that's one of the great benefits that our uh, e-mount camera system enjoys. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I think has most amazed me this last decade is the frequency at which you've turned out lenses. And, and from my point of view, the, the frequency with which the technology, most people see the outside and they look at the image. I take it apart and go, oh, look what they've done here. And they've made this stronger and they fixed this thing over here. Every time you put out a new lens, there's something new. And a couple of months ago, you were showing me uh, information on, I think, your newest, it's, I think it's still the newest prime lens release. And you showed me a lens element and I just looked at it and went, wait, you can't do that. <laughs> and uh, you kind of explained to me that, yeah, you did it. And uh, I was I was awed. It was a really extreme double A sphere kind of element. I think, uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Because that's, that's huge. Sure. One of the big changes in our lens lens development for e-mount was the launch in 2016 of our G-Master line. So with G-Master, to realize the best possible picture quality and really to have no compromise in anything that the lens was doing, uh, we created what was called an extreme aspheric element or an XA element. And uh, again, different manufacturers are uh, uh, you know, tackling the challenge of creating highly, highly unusual shapes with different manufacturing techniques. And with extreme aspherics, what we do is we leverage our glass molding technology to realize surface precision of the element that's created down to uh, a hundredth of a micron. And we found that the quality of the background defocused highlights, the quality of the bokeh, had a lot to do with the surface precision of extreme aspheric elements. So we needed the aspherics to realize the resolving power and to minimize distortion, particularly aberration. But we also needed the surface precision to realize the beautiful background bokeh because lens manufacturers had been known to make sharp lenses or they'd been known to make beautifully defocused background lenses, but rarely, if ever, had there been both characteristics in a single lens. And that was our target, was to combine resolving power and, uh, and beautiful background bokeh. And that's what the extreme aspherics were for. And to realize them, we had to um, really gear up on our uh, glass molding and our uh, glass molding precision technology to realize elements that simply were unavailable, that had not been, yet been made. And that started with the first three G Master lenses that we introduced in 2016 and it expanded progressively over the last four years. And now our latest, the 12 to 24 GM, is an F28 12 to 24, which no one makes. And the front element is the largest XA element we've ever made. And the cross section of that element shows that it would be almost impossible to make that without that uh, technology. Didn't you even have to develop a new coding technology to make that? Yeah, yeah. The uh, the curvature is so unusual uh, that we had to revise our Nano you know, AR coding uh, to get it to deposit evenly uh, across the full range of the curve because the curve is so extreme. It's this pushing the limits of the material science and the device technology that lets us create the products because in many ways, the products that we see represents the extent to which the uh, material science and device technology has been pushed in an effort to create products that do more and more and satisfy user requirements better and better. Yeah, I think the takeaway message for everybody we just put to sleep with the technical stuff is it really does make a difference. It makes a better lens. Oh, yeah. And the uh, the actuators that we're using in the lens is another thing. We started e-mount lenses in 2010 using stepping motors. Uh, stepping motors are much different than the DC motor. A lot of SLR lenses use, and they're much different than the uh, rotational actuators, even the um, supersonic motors that many SLR lens, most SLR lenses use. But we realized that linear actuators that did not use rotational motion at all were really the ideal, and we would have to make them that way if we were to be able to get the lenses to respond rapidly enough. Stepping motors are not the same as linear because they're still transferring rotational energy to linear energy. And uh, it makes a big difference in how fast the lens can focus. Oftentimes we think about high frame rates in cameras, but the hit rate, the number of each of those frames that's in focus 
largely depends on whether or not the lens can keep up with the instructions of the camera. It's the difference between moving in a straight line and going up a spiral staircase. Yeah, exactly. Great analogy there. Yeah. But we, we got some questions though we got to get to. Uh, the important stuff. Zach wants to talk about beer, I think. Oh. Yeah. So I've, I've talked to a few people uh, internally at Sony that work with you day to day, and they say that you're a bit of a beer aficionado, huh? Yeah. I'm a, what, was I, the word I, aficionado I, or snob? Well, I, I think I think they use the aficionado. Okay, yeah, let's <laughs> check it. I've, uh, I've also been a snob, but I've been schooled as well. Um, San Diego <laughs> is uh, San Diego, and I've only lived in San Diego for twenty years. I'm I'm a I'm a Connecticut guy. I've never lived west of the Hudson River until uh, until I moved out here in two thousand. San Diego is pretty well known as a as a beer town, and uh, once I got here at developed quite a taste for it because San Diego beers got a lot of wonderful things. But I will say that uh, it was about four years ago that somebody introduced me to the beer that was being made in New England, in Vermont and Long Island and things like that. And uh, I was quickly schooled. Now I'm a fan of what's called the uh, East Coast hazy IPAs. So it's a it's a constant it's a constantly changing thing, but uh, I'm a wine guy, I'm a beer guy, and I enjoy both. And uh, living on the West Coast gives you all kinds of wonderful opportunities. So I'm in I'm in California as well. I'm up in LA. Uh, what what's the best beer to come out of California in your opinion? Oh, gee, it's hard to say because there's so many, and uh, taste and opinion changes so much. Uh, but I don't make it up to LA much, but I have. Uh, folks, uh, good friends of mine who are up in Anaheim and Orange County a lot. But if you get over to the brewery, uh, spelled with a U, B-R-U-E-R-Y, uh, and then over to Noble Ale Works and uh, Smog City Brewing, I've heard fabulous things about that. And I'm sure there's many others that I haven't even heard of. So, Thank you so much for taking the time, Mark. It has sure been a pleasure. Well, thanks for having me on. It's been, uh, it's been a great honor and a pleasure for me. And I miss you guys and uh, hope to see you soon. Thanks. Looking forward to it. Thanks for listening to the Lint Journals podcast. If you want to grab a spot in line, the A7S III is available for pre-order on our site now. We also carry just about everything else Sony makes, from the RX100 to the Venice. So head to lensjournals.com if you want to try out anything you've heard about here. Lastly, we don't normally tease upcoming episodes, but I'll make a special exception for Halloween. Tune in two weeks from now on the 29th when we'll be sharing gear horror stories, the worst, most terrifying things that have ever happened to our gear in the field. I promise this stuff will chill you to your very core, and I'm already Googling werewolf sound effects. The Lens Rentals Podcast is a production of LensRentals.com. If you've got a question or topic you'd like covered on the show, email us at podcast at LensRentals.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-609-LENS. That's 901-609-LENS. If you're enjoying the show, please review us on iTunes and subscribe in your podcast app of choice. Make sure to check the show notes for a link to this week's coupon code. And as always, Roger Sokala will leave you with an inspirational quote. A happy or sad ending simply depends on where you stop your story. Orson Welles